On the 22nd of June, 2025, in Dubai, UAE, Luke and Mike Bell set a new world drone speed record of 580 kilometers per hour, or 360 miles an hour. Their Peregrine drone was powered by the AOS Supernova 3220. And today, I'm gonna to share with you what it takes to design and manufacture the fastest drone motor in the world. The challenges we faced along the way how we overcame them, and the road ahead to 600 kilometers per hour and beyond. It's a lot to cover in one video, so let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right into it. I first met Luke and Mike in July, 2024. They had just broken the world drone speed record with their drone Peregrine 2, hitting an astounding 480 kilometers per hour. That's 300 miles an hour. During my conversation with them, link down below, it became clear that they were pushing their FPV hardware to its absolute limits, and in many cases, well beyond. Despite this, they wanted to go faster, much, much faster. And the motors and props they were using, the T-Motor 3115 and the APC 7x11, simply didn't have any more performance to give at those insane speeds. At this time, I had just launched the Supernova 2207-1570KV, an 8S motor that delivered more power and torque than anything I had ever tested before on 5-inch props. I was also working on a 10-inch Synlifter motor as part of some consulting work that I was doing at that time. Luke and Mike were clear that they needed a huge uplift in power and torque to drive a larger, even steeper pitched prop for their next record attempt. They needed the motor to be as narrow as possible to minimize drag and as robust as possible to deal with the totally insane levels of current and torque that they would be drawing at huge RPMs. That moment fundamentally changed what would become the AOS Supernova 3220. No longer would that motor just be for 10 inch sin lifters. It would be a motor designed from the outset with another purpose to break a world record. From the very start, there was a piece of knowledge that I had that made this challenge seem possible. And it was something that I had only just learned designing the Supernova 2207-1570KV. And that is that once you've optimized the magnetic design of a motor, that optimal design stays the same for any prop and any battery voltage. You can use that same optimal design and adjust the KV of the windings to match the battery voltage to the torque RPM curve of your target propeller to get the best performance. That meant that the best magnetic design for a 10 inch sin lifter and the best magnetic design for Luke and Mike's world record attempt should be exactly the same. I have no idea how to design a motor to do 580 kilometers per hour. No one did, it had never been done but I knew very well how to optimize a 3220 size motor for a 10 inch Synlifter prop. And once I'd done that, the design should be exactly the same for Luke and Mike's world record attempt. We would just need to find the right KV for the windings. So I got to work. The first place to start with any new motor design is a selection of a stator. Now, of course, it's possible to cut a custom stator for a new motor design, but the tooling cost and time rarely make sense for new FPV motors where the volumes are quite low. It's often much better to select from the range of stators that are currently in production and find one that best matches what you want to do and work from there. When selecting a stator, there is a critical trade-off that you need to manage. You obviously want the largest and widest possible stator tooth to carry the magnetic flux from the air gap through the stator, around the back iron and into the adjacent stator tooth. But you also want the largest possible cross-sectional area for the copper windings so that you can use the thickest possible copper wire to reduce the DC resistance of the windings and increase the efficiency of the motor for a given KV. These two requirements are in direct opposition to each other, and so it's a trade-off and you have to find the right one. As well as the magnetic and electrical constraint, there was also the aerodynamic constraint. Luke and Mike were clear that there was a significant drag penalty for increasing the diameter of the motor, and they wanted to stick as closely as possible to the diameter of motor they'd used for their 480 km per hour world record. 
So I worked with RCM Power, you'll hear more from them later, to look at a number of different stator designs all around 30 millimeters diameter. Each of them had a slightly different tooth width and a slightly different balance between area for windings and area for silicon steel to carry the magnetic flux. Luke and Mike estimated that the ideal KV for this new motor would be around 900 KV. So I simulated each stator with a 900 KV winding to see the balance between torque, power and efficiency that we could get from each design. One design came out ahead, RCM Power's 32mm stator. So that was the one we selected and I moved on to optimizing the rotor design to extract the maximum possible performance out of this chosen stator. At this stage, I'd love to say that there is a simple rule that allows you to optimize the design of a rotor for a given stator. Unfortunately, if there is, I certainly haven't found it. This is a complex multivariable optimization problem where we're looking for the ideal geometry of the magnets and the flux ring in the rotor, and we have a whole bunch of input parameters that affect this. Some of them are constant, like the energy product of the magnets that we're using, their coercivity, and the permeability of the steels in the stator and the rotor. Some of them are to do with manufacturing, like how tight an air gap we think we're gonna be able to hold when we manufacture the motor. And some of them are dependent on the motor operating point, like what RPM is it gonna be spinning at? How much current is it gonna be drawing? And what's the distribution of magnetic flux gonna be in the stator and the rotor when we're looking to get the maximum power out of the motor? To make this even more difficult, it's actually relatively computationally expensive to evaluate a given design at a certain operating point. So we wanna kind of minimize the number of simulations that we run as we optimize the motor. Otherwise, the simulation space that we have to cover will just explode. Fortunately, the maths to do this was developed in the 70s and 80s and is now in widespread use helping optimize the training of AI models like ChatGPT. This short animation shows how the Bayesian optimization approach that I'm using works. You can see that the true relationship between the input and output is shown as the black line. The Bayesian optimizer also creates an estimate of the relationship between the input and output, which is shown as the purple line, and that's based on the results that it's evaluated so far. It also comes up with an estimate of its uncertainty in that prediction. If you've got a large distance between points, the uncertainty of the relationship between those points gets quite big. The optimizer chooses the next point to evaluate based on where it thinks the most probable optimum lies, and it evaluates that point. It then uses that extra data to update both its estimate of the relationship between inputs and outputs across the whole field, and also its estimate of the uncertainty in its predictions. The magic of this approach is that it does a really good job of homing in on the optimum very quickly. If you have a pretty well-behaved function, it will find a good estimate for that function after only a few iterations. But of course, we're only looking at this optimization happening in 1D. You could imagine it happening in 2D, where it would be like a, a terrain with hills and valleys. But when we're optimizing motor design, we are doing this optimization simultaneously across dozens of different dimensions. And so even though the Bayesian approach is pretty efficient in terms of the number of simulations that it needs to run, it still takes a lot of time to find the optimum. One trick that I used to save a lot of time in computation was to start off by doing an initial optimization run with a 2D transient simulation looking just in the radial plane of the motor. This is a good approximation in the middle of the motor, but to tackle the end effects at the top and bottom of the stator, a full 3D transient simulation is needed. Optimizing the rotor overhang can capture just a few precious additional percentage points of improvement in torque and power, and it doesn't add much motor weight at all. But the trade-off is incredibly sensitive to the height of the motor, the width of the air gap, and the precise geometry of the stator, the magnets, and the flux ring. The Supernova 3220 was really the first time that I felt like I had the tooling developed to a point where I could dive into this aspect of the design, and I was really pleased with the extra performance that we were able to extract with this method. At this point, I had the CAD design for a record-breaking motor but a great design is nothing without great manufacturing. So this is where the story hands over to RCM Power. 
Hi there, John. Thank you so much for joining me. What goes into manufacturing a record-breaking motor? So, first of all, the uh, for the stator, this is the most important part from the motor we develop. So, uh, actually, the stamping we just outsource to an external factory, but the design and uh, the optimized electric magnetic structure is by in-house team. For AOS motors specific, we were using the top grade steel from 1.5, non-oriented silicon steel with special post-processing. So the stator is one important magnetic component, but what about the magnets and the flux ring? Uh, so we have sourcing the best uh, magnet from China. So for the high corrosivity and high remanence. So excellent for the high temperature performance. And for AOS specific, we will use uh, the 52H to 52SH grade magnet uh, for the tiles. The flux ring, so we, uh, we're using uh, high premium steel. So this is uh, the spec which we are keeping confidential. The material is quite difficult to process, but the result has a high magnet saturation, improved efficiency and reduced motor temperature. And once you've sourced the magnets and machined the flux ring, how do you go about installing them to ensure the minimum gap between the tiles? So first of all, we're doing the uh, custom installation, the fixture design of each motors. So uh, before the magnet to be installed, we'll make the pre-inspection. So we find the deflected unit screen out before the installation. And for the enhancer, we will using the uh, special high performance screw from the Loctite. Uh, which is the German company we are using. Once you have the magnets installed in the flux ring, how do you go about machining the rotor bell and the base of the motor? Uh, for the processing, uh, we have dozens of the four SS CNC machine, which is uh, making the uh, bell and the uh, base unit. So, and the precision to be 0 0.01 millimeter accuracy. So uh, for the bell and base material, you will be using the custom 7075 aluminium consistency, anodizing and properties. So, and the shaft material, we're using TC4 titanium alloy. The shaft QC, we will do in the batch load testing and pre-testing for stability and consistency. With all the parts machined, I guess the next stage is winding. Can you talk us through the winding process and the materials that you use? For the one thing, we are fully machinized and the, uh, we are using the 4SS full shuffle winding machine. So to keep the process to be accurate and uh, fast enough to make mass production. For the wire selection, it's just based on the motor purpose. So be between like single, single or multi-strand and the temperature rating is from 180 to 300 degrees Celsius. So I know the uh, AOS we are using the 250 degree of Celsius one, so which is also the confidential from the military grade. For the QC test, we're doing the internal resistance, insulation, inductance, and the appearance check. Post winding, the secondary insulation treatment to be applied. With the winding done, I guess it's on to final assembly. Can you talk us through that? Uh, for the final assembly, uh, the technicians, which is average for five years experience, so all follow strict to SOPS. And also the communication is maintain contact with the design and procurement. And the QC technicians will get uh, more than eight years of experience and extremely demanding steadiness. Now the motor is fully assembled. Can you talk us through the dynamic balancing process that you go through? I think this is really critical, particularly for a high RPM application, like a world record attempt. So what the equipment we use is the multi-precision laser balancer, which is a very accurate machine. And the balancing can be one to three minogram accuracy. And we're using uh, the standard control to uh, three minogram within for the balancing, even at the smaller motors like CO7, CO2 and XCO2. And we're using uh, the balancing to one minogram level. So we're doing the process minimum for two balance test adjustment per motors. Incredible. Thank you so much, John, for talking us through the whole process. And that brings us to the record attempt itself. Dubai is both the best and the worst place to attempt a world drone speed record. It's hot, dry and dusty. In some ways, the heat is a benefit. 
The heat reduces the density of the air and therefore the aerodynamic drag, allowing you to achieve a higher top speed with the same power. It's the same reason why aircraft can fly faster at higher altitudes. The heat is also a benefit for the battery. It accelerates the electrochemical reactions within the cells, reducing their internal resistance and allowing them to deliver even more power. But for motors and ESCs, heat is the enemy. On testing runs in South Africa, the Supernova 3220s were already on the limit of overheating as they pushed past 500 km an hour. While the 250 degrees C rated enamel that we were using for the windings was up to the challenge, during full throttle runs, the magnets themselves were getting so hot that they began to demagnetize, risking desyncs at high speed. In the desert heat of Dubai, this problem became critical. I think at this point, lesser teams would have thrown in the towel as flight after flight ended in failure. But Luke and Mike came up with a really innovative solution to this problem. They used dry ice to pre-cool the motors down to minus 78 degrees C before takeoff, buying themselves precious extra seconds at full throttle for a final attempt. With time running out and the adjudicator from Guinness World Records looking on, luck finally broke their way and Luke was able to glimpse for an instant 579 kilometers an hour in his goggle on-screen display. Later analysis of the GPS data would show that the instantaneous top speed of that flight was ever so slightly higher at 580 kilometers an hour, a new world record. Even though the 580 km per hour world record is now secure, Luke and Mike still want to go even faster. They're targeting 624 km an hour, which would give Peregrine the title as the world's fastest all-electric vehicle of any type. However, to get there, there are still a lot of challenges to overcome. And just speaking to the motor, we have started to see magnet cracking in the recent record attempts, which is a testament to just how much stress the motors are being put under. We're taking a 6S motor designed to be run at 25 volts and running it at 12S battery voltage, which is 50 volts. And that's pushing the RPMs much higher than the motor is intended for. And also because the motor is being pre-cooled to minus 78 degrees and then heating up to over 100 degrees during the few seconds of a record breaking run, the thermal shock that's being applied to the magnets is also enormous. However, we do have some ideas as to how to further reinforce the design and it remains to be seen just how far and how fast Peregrine and the AOS Supernova 3220 can go. However, one thing is for certain, if you happen to see a new, larger, more powerful supernova motor in the coming months, you'd be right to wonder if it'll be streaking across the skies of South Africa, propelling Luke and Mike to yet another world record. That's all I have for you for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. So until next time, happy flying.